Hello and welcome to the Fighting Moose Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Hendrickson. This is a podcast where I retell stories, some fictional and some historical, that can be enjoyed by people of all ages. Today, I start reading the book, The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus, written by L. Frank Baum. This book is broken up into three parts and coincides well with the three main releases I do per month. Also, this past weekend, I got a shipment of stickers in the mail. What I would like to do is this. If you leave a review on iTunes, I would like to send you a sticker pack with three stickers. The picture of these stickers can be seen on our social media accounts and also on the website. It's just a small token of my appreciation for listening to the podcast. I hope that your holiday season is going well, and I hope that Santa will bring you everything you want for Christmas. Now, let's turn to today's story. I hope you enjoy. Let's begin. Section 1. Youth. Chapter 1. Burzee. Have you ever heard of the great forest of Burzee? Nurse used to sing of it when I was a child. She sang of the big tree trunks standing close together, with their roots intertwining below the earth and their branches intertwining above it, of the rough coating of bark and queer gnarled limbs, of the bushy foliage that roofed the entire forest, save where the sunbeams found a path through which to touch the ground in little spots and to cast weird and curious shadows over the mosses, the lichens, and the drifts of dried leaves. The forest of Bursey is mighty and grand and awesome to those who steal beneath its shade. Coming from the sunlit meadows into its mazes, it seems at first gloomy, then pleasant, and afterward filled with never-ending delights. For hundreds of years, it has flourished in all its magnificence, the silence of its enclosure unbroken save by the chirp of busy chipmunks, the growl of wild beasts, and the songs of birds. Yet Bursey has its inhabitants for all this. Nature peopled it in the beginning with fairies, nooks, riles, and nymphs. As long as the forest stands, it will be a home, a refuge, and a playground to those sweet immortals who revel undisturbed in its depths. Civilization has never yet reached Bursey. Will it ever? I wonder. Chapter 2 The Child of the Forest Once so long ago, our great-grandfathers could scarcely have heard it mentioned, there lived within the great forest of Bursey a wood nymph named Nasil. She was closely related to the mighty Queen Zerline, and her home was beneath the shade of a wide-spreading oak. Once every year, on budding day, when the trees put forth their new buds, Nasil held the golden chalice of Ak to the lips of the queen, who drank therefrom to the prosperity of the forest. So you see, she was a nymph of some importance, and moreover, it is said she was highly regarded because of her beauty and grace. When she was created, she could not have told. Queen Zerline could not have told. The great Ak himself could not have told. It was long ago when the world was new and nymphs were needed to guard the forests and to minister to the wants of the young trees. Then, on some day not remembered, Nasil sprang into being, radiant, lovely, straight, and slim as the sapling she was created to guard. Her hair was the color that lines a chestnut burr. Her eyes were blue in the sunlight and purple in the shade. Her cheeks bloomed with a faint pink that edges the clouds at sunset. Her lips were full red pouting and sweet. For costume, she adopted oak leaf green. All the wood nymphs were dressed in that color, and no, no other was so desirable. Her dainty feet were sandal-clad, while her head remained bare of covering other than her silken tresses. Nasil's duties were few and simple. She kept hurtful weeds from growing beneath her trees and sapping the earth food required by her charges. She frightened away the gadgulls, who took evil delight in flying against the tree trunks and wounding them so that they drooped and died from the poisonous contact. In dry seasons, she carried water from the brooks and pools and moistened the roots of her thirsty dependents. This was in the beginning. The weeds had now learned to avoid the forests where wood nymphs dwelt. The loathsome gadgulls no longer dared come nigh. 
The trees had become old and sturdy and could bear the drought better than when fresh sprouted. So Nasil's duties were lessened and time grew laggard, while succeeding years became more tiresome and uneventful than the nymph's joyous spirit loved. Truly, the forest dwellers did not lack amusement. Each full moon they danced in the royal circle of the queen. There were also the Feast of Nuts, the Jubilee of Autumn Tintings, the solemn ceremony of leaf shedding, and the revelry of budding day. But these periods of enjoyment were far apart, and left many weary hours between. That a wood nymph should grow discontented was not thought of by Nasil's sisters. It came upon her only after many years of brooding. But when once she had settled in her mind that life was irksome, she had no patience with her condition, and longed to do something of real interest and to pass her days in ways hitherto undreamed of by forest nymphs. The law of the forest alone restrained her from going forth in search of adventure. While this mood lay heavy upon pretty Nasil, it chanced that the great Ack visited the forest of Burzee and allowed the wood nymphs, as was their wont, to lie at his feet and listen to the words of wisdom that fell from his lips. Ack is the master woodsman of the world. He sees everything and knows more than the sons of men. That night he held the queen's hand, for he loved the nymphs as a father loves his children, and Nasil lay at his feet with many of her sisters and earnestly hearkened as he spoke. We live so happily, my fair ones, in our forest glades, said Ack, stroking his grizzled beard thoughtfully, that we know nothing of the sorrow and misery that fall to the lot of those poor mortals who inhabit the open spaces of the earth. They are not of our race, it is true, yet compassion well befits beings so fairly favored as ourselves. Often as I pass by the dwelling of some suffering mortal, I am tempted to stop and banish the poor thing's misery. Yet suffering, in moderation, is the natural lot of mortals, and it is not our place to interfere with the laws of nature. Nevertheless, said the fair queen, nodding her golden head at the master woodsman, it would be a vain guess that Ack has often assisted those hapless mortals. Ack smiled. Sometimes he replied, when they are very young, children, the mortals call them, I have stopped to rescue them from misery. The men and women I dare not interfere with, they must bear the burdens nature has imposed upon them. But the helpless infants, the innocent children of men, have a right to be happy until they become full-grown and able to bear the trials of humanity, so I feel I am justified in assisting them. Not long ago, a year maybe, I found four poor children huddled in a wooden hut, slowly freezing to death. Their parents had gone to a neighboring village for food and had left a fire to warm their little ones while they were absent. But a storm arose and drifted the snow in their path, so they were long on the road. Meantime, the fire went out, and the frost crept into the bones of the waiting children. Poor things, murmured the queen softly. What did you do? I called Nelko, bidding him fetch wood from my forests and breathe upon it until the fire blazed again and warmed the little room where the children lay. Then they ceased shivering and fell asleep until their parents came. I am glad you did thus, said the good queen, beaming upon the master and Nasil, who had eagerly listened to every word, echoed in a whisper, I too am glad. And this very night, continued Ack, as I came to the edge of Burzee, I heard a feeble cry, which I judged came from a human infant. I looked about me, and found, close to the forest, a helpless babe, lying quite naked upon the grasses and wailing piteously. Not far away, screened by the forest, crouched Shiegra, the lioness intent upon devouring the infant for her evening meal. "'And what did you do, Ack?' asked the queen breathlessly. "'Not much, being in a hurry to greet my nymphs. But I commanded Shiegra to lie close to the babe and to give it her milk to quiet its hunger, and I told her to send word throughout the forest to all beasts and reptiles that the child should not be harmed. "'I am glad you did thus,' said the good queen again, in a tone of relief." But this time, Nasil did not echo her words, for the nymph, filled with a strange resolve, had suddenly stolen away from the group. Swiftly, her lithe form darted through the forest paths until she reached the edge of mighty Burzee, when she paused to gaze curiously about her. 
Never until now had she ventured so far, for the law of the forest had placed the nymphs in its inmost depths. Nasil knew she was breaking the law, but the thought did not give pause to her dainty feet. She had decided to see with her own eyes this infant Ak had told of, for she had never yet beheld a child of man. All the immortals are fully grown, there are no children among them. Peering through the trees, Nasil saw the child laying on the grass, but now it was sweetly sleeping, having been comforted by the milk drawn from Shiegra. It was not old enough to know what peril means. If it did not feel hunger, it was content. Softly, the nymph stole to the side of the babe and knelt upon the sward, her long robe of rose leaf color spreading about her like a gossamer cloud. Her lovely countenance expressed curiosity and surprise, but, most of all, a tender, womanly pity. The babe was newborn, chubby and pink. It was entirely helpless. While the nymph gazed, the infant opened its eyes, smiled upon her, and stretched out two dimpled arms. In another instant, Nasil had caught it to her breast and was hurrying with it through the forest path. Chapter 3 The Adoption The master woodsman suddenly rose with knitted brows. There is a strange presence in the forest, he declared. Then the queen and her nymphs turned and saw standing before them Nasil, with the sleeping infant clasped tightly in her arms and a defiant look in her deep blue eyes. And thus for a moment they remained, the nymphs filled with surprise and consternation, but the brow of the master woodsman gradually clearing as he gazed intently upon the beautiful immortal who had willfully broken the law. Then the great Ak, to the wonder of all, laid his hand softly on the seal's flowing locks and kissed her on her fair forehead. For the first time within my knowledge, said he gently, a nymph has defied me and my laws, yet in my heart can I find no word of chiding. What is your desire, Nasil? Let me keep the child, she answered, beginning to tremble and falling on her knees in supplication. Here, in the forest of Bursey, where the human race has never yet penetrated? questioned Ak. Here, in the forest of Bursey, replied the nymph boldly. It is my home, and I am weary for lack of occupation. Let me care for the babe, see how weak and helpless it is. Surely it cannot harm Bursey, nor the master woodsman of the world. But the law, child, the law, cried Ak sternly. The law is made by the master woodsman, returned Nasil. If he bids me care for the babe he himself has saved from death, who in all the world dare oppose me? Queen Zerline, who had listened intently to this conversation, clapped her pretty hands gleefully at the nymph's answer. You are fairly trapped, Oak, she exclaimed laughing. Now, I pray you, give heed to Nasil's petition. The woodsman, as was his habit when in thought, stroked his grizzled beard slowly. Then he said, She shall keep the babe, and I will give it my protection. But I warn you all that as this is the first time I have relaxed the law, so shall it be the last time. Never more to the end of the world shall a mortal be adopted by an immortal. Otherwise would we abandon our happy existence for one of trouble and anxiety. Good night, my nymphs. Then Ak was gone from the midst, and Nasil hurried away to her bower to rejoice over her newfound treasure. Chapter 4 Claws Another day found Nasil's bower the most popular place in the forest. The nymphs clustered around her and the child that lay asleep in her lap, with expressions of curiosity and delight. Nor were they wanting in praises for the great Ak's kindness in allowing Nasil to keep the babe and to care for it. Even the queen came to peer into the innocent childish face and to hold a helpless chubby fist in her own fair hand. What shall we call him, Nasil? she asked, smiling. He must have a name, you know. Let him be called Claus, answered Nasil, for that means a little one. Rather, let him be called Neklaus, returned the queen, for that will mean Nasil's little one. The nymphs clapped their hands in delight, and Neklaus became the infant's name, although Nasil loved best to call him Claus, and in after days many of her sisters followed her example. 
Nasil gathered the softest moss in all the forest for claws to lie upon, and she made his bed in her own bower. Of food the infant had no lack. The nymphs searched the forest for bell udders, which grow upon the go tree, and when opened are found to be filled with sweet milk. And the soft-eyed does willingly gave a share of their milk to support the little stranger, while Shiegra the lioness often crept stealthily into Nasil's bower and purred softly as she lay beside the babe and fed it. So the little one flourished and grew big and sturdy day by day, while Nasil taught him to speak and to walk and to play. His thoughts and words were sweet and gentle, for the nymphs knew no evil and their hearts were pure and loving. He became the pet of the forest, for Axe decree had forbidden beast or reptile to molest him, and he walked fearlessly wherever his will guided him. Presently, the news reached the other immortals that the nymphs of Bursey had adopted a human infant, and that the act had been sanctioned by the great Ack. Therefore, many of them came to visit the little stranger, looking upon him with much interest. First the Riles, who are first cousins to the wood nymphs, although so differently formed, for the riles are required to watch over the flowers and plants as the nymphs watch over the forest trees. They search the wide world for the food required by the roots of the flowering plants, while the brilliant colors possessed by their full-blown flowers are due to the dyes placed in the soil by the riles, which are drawn through the little veins in the roots and the body of the plants as they reach maturity. The riles are a busy people, for their flowers bloom and fade continually, but they are merry and light-hearted and are very popular with the other immortals. Next came the nooks, whose duty it is to watch over the beasts of the world, both gentle and wild. The nooks have a hard time of it, since many of the beasts are ungovernable and rebel against restraint. But they know how to manage them, after all, and you will find that certain laws of the nooks are obeyed by even the most ferocious animals. Their anxieties make the nooks look old and worn and crooked, and their natures are a bit rough from associating with wild creatures continually. Yet they are most useful to humanity and to the world in general, as their laws are the only laws the forest beasts recognize except those of the master woodsman. Then there were the fairies, the guardians of mankind, who were much interested in the adoption of claws because their own laws forbade them to become familiar with their human charges. There are instances on record where the fairies have shown themselves to human beings and have even conversed with them, but they are supposed to guard the lives of mankind unseen and unknown. And if they favor some people more than others, it is because these have won such distinction fairly, as the fairies are very just and impartial. But the idea of adopting a child of men had never occurred to them because it was in every way opposed to their laws. So their curiosity was intense to behold the little stranger adopted by Nasil and her sister nymphs. Claus looked upon the immortals who thronged around him with fearless eyes and smiling lips. He rode laughingly upon the shoulders of the merry Riles. He mischievously pulled the gray beards of the low-browed nooks. He rested his curly head confidently upon the dainty bosom of the fairy queen herself, and the Riles loved the sound of his laughter. The nooks loved his courage, the fairies loved his innocence. The boy made friends of them all, and learned to know their laws intimately. No forest flower was trampled beneath his feet, lest the friendly Riles should be grieved. He never interfered with the beasts of the forest, lest his friends the nooks should become angry. The fairies he loved dearly, but, knowing nothing of mankind, he could not understand that he was the only one of his race admitted to friendly intercourse with them. Indeed, Claus came to consider that he alone, of all the forest people, had no like nor fellow. To him, the forest was the world. He had no idea that millions of toiling, striving human creatures existed, and he was happy and content. Chapter 5 the Master Woodsman. Years pass swiftly in Burzee, for the nymphs have no need to regard time in any way. Even centuries make no change in the dainty creatures. Ever and ever they remain the same, immortal and unchanging. Claus, however, being mortal, grew to manhood day by day. 
Nasia was disturbed presently to find him too big to lie in her lap, and he had a desire for other food than milk. His stout legs carried him far into Burzee's heart, where he gathered supplies of nuts and berries, as well as several sweet and wholesome roots, which suited his stomach better than the bell udders. He sought Nasil's bower less frequently, till finally it became his custom to remain thither only to sleep. The nymph, who had come to love him dearly, was puzzled to comprehend the changed nature of her charge, and unconsciously altered her own mood of life to conform to his whims. She followed him readily through the forest paths, as did many of her sister nymphs, explaining as they walked all the mysteries of the gigantic wood and the habits and nature of the living things which dwelt beneath its shade. The language of the beasts became clear to little claws, but he never could understand their sulky and morose tempers. Only the squirrels, the mice, and the rabbits seemed to possess cheerful and merry natures. Yet would the boy laugh when the panther growled, and stroked the bear's glossy coat while the creature snarled and bared his teeth menacingly. The growls and snarls were not for Klaus, he well knew, so what did they matter? He could sing the songs of the bees, recite the poetry of the wood flowers, and relate the history of every blinking owl in Burzee. He helped the riles to feed their plants and the nooks to keep order among the animals. The little immortals regarded him as a privileged person, being especially protected by Queen Zerline and her nymphs and favored by the great Ack himself. One day, the master woodsman came back to the forest of Burzee. He had visited, in turn, all his forests throughout the world, and they were many and broad. Not until he entered the glade, where the queen and her nymphs were assembled to greet him, did Ack remember the child he had permitted Nasil to adopt. Then he found, sitting familiarly in the circle of lovely immortals, a broad-shouldered, stalwart youth who, when erect, stood fully as high as the shoulder of the master himself. Ack paused, silent and frowning, to bend his piercing gaze upon Claus. The clear eyes met his own steadfastly, and the woodsman gave a sigh of relief as he marked their placid depths and read the youth's brave and innocent heart. Nevertheless, as Ack sat beside the fair queen and the golden chalice, filled with rare nectar, passed from lip to lip, the master woodsman was strangely silent and reserved and stroked his beard many times with a thoughtful motion. With morning, he called Claus aside in kindly fashion, saying, Bid goodbye for a time to Nasil and her sisters, for you shall accompany me on my journey through the world. The venture pleased Claus, who knew well the honor of being companion of the master woodsman of the world. But Nasil wept for the first time in her life, and clung to the boy's neck as if she could not bear to let him go. The nymph who had mothered this sturdy youth was still as dainty, as charming, and beautiful as when she had dared to face Ack with the babe clasped to her breast, nor was her love less great. Ack beheld the two clinging together, seemingly as brother and sister, to one another, and again he wore his thoughtful look. Chapter 6 Claus Discovers Humanity Taking Claus to a small clearing in the forest, the master said, Place your hand upon my girdle, and hold fast while we journey through the air. For now shall we encircle the world, and look upon many of the haunts of those men from whom you are descended. These words caused Claus to marvel, for until now he had thought himself the only one of his kind upon the earth. Yet in silence he grasped firmly the girdle of the great Ack, his astonishment forbidding speech. Then the vast forest of Burzee seemed to fall away from their feet, and the youth found himself passing swiftly through the air at a great height. Ere long there were spires beneath them, while buildings of many shapes and colors met their downward view. It was a city of men, and Ack, pausing to descend, led Claus to its enclosure, said the master, So long as you hold fast to my girdle, you will remain unseen by all mankind though seeing clearly yourself. To release your grasp will be to separate yourself forever from me and your home in Burzee. One of the first laws of the forest is obedience, and Claus had no thought of disobeying the master's wish. He clung fast to the girdle and remained invisible. Thereafter, with each moment passed in the city, 
the youth's wonder grew. He, who had supposed himself created differently from all others, now found the earth swarming with creatures of his own kind. Indeed, said Ack, the immortals are few, but the mortals are many. Claus looked earnestly upon his fellows. There were sad faces, gay and reckless faces, pleasant faces, anxious faces, and kindly faces, all mingled in puzzling disorder. Some worked at tedious tasks, some strutted in impudent conceit, some were thoughtful and grave, while others seemed happy and content. Men of many natures were there, as everywhere, and Claus found much to please him and much to make him sad. But especially he noted the children, first curiously, then eagerly, then lovingly. Ragged little ones rolled in the dust of the streets, playing with scraps and pebbles. Other children, gaily dressed, were propped upon cushions and fed with sugar plums. Yet the children of the rich were not happier than those playing with the dust and pebbles, it seemed to Claus. Childhood is the time of man's greatest content, said Ack, following the youth's thoughts. Tis during these years of innocent pleasure that the little ones are most free from care. Tell me, said Claus, why do not all these babies fare alike? Because they are born in both cottage and palace, returned the master. The difference in the wealth of the parents determines the lot of the child. Some are carefully tended and clothed in silks and dainty linen. Others are neglected and covered with rags. Yet all seem equally fair and sweet, said Claus thoughtfully. While they are babes, yes, agreed Ack. Their joy is in being alive, and they do not stop to think. In after years, the doom of mankind overtakes them, and they find they must struggle and worry, work and fret, to gain the wealth that is so dear to the hearts of men. Such things are unknown in the forest where you were reared. Claus was silent a moment. Then he asked, Why was I reared in the forest among those who are not of my race? Then Ack, in a gentle voice, told him the story of his babyhood, how he had been abandoned at the forest's edge and left a prey to wild beasts, and how the loving nymph Nasil had rescued him and brought him to manhood under the protection of the immortals. Yet I am not of them, said Claus musingly. You are not of them, returned the woodsman. The nymph who cared for you as a mother seems now like a sister to you. By and by, when you grow old and gray, she will seem like a daughter. Yet another brief span, and you will be but a memory, while she remains in the seal. Then why, if a man must perish, is he born? demanded the boy. Everything perishes except the world itself and its keepers, answered Ack. But while life lasts, everything on earth has its use. The wise seek ways to be helpful to the world, and the helpful ones are sure to live again. Much of this Claus failed to understand fully, but a longing seized him to become helpful to his fellows, and he remained grave and thoughtful while they resumed their journey. They visited many dwellings of men in many parts of the world, watching farmers toil in the fields, warriors dash into cruel fray, and merchants exchange their goods for bits of white and yellow metal. And everywhere the eyes of Claus sought out the children in love and pity, for the thought of his own helpless babyhood was strong within him, and he yearned to give help to the innocent little ones of his race, even as he had been succored by the kindly nymph. Day by day, the master woodsman and his pupil traversed the earth, Ack speaking but seldom to the youth who clung steadfastly to his girdle, but guiding him into all places where he might become familiar with the lives of human beings. And at last they returned to the grand old forest of Bursey, where the master set Claus down within the circle of nymphs, among whom the pretty Nasile anxiously awaited him. The brow of the great Ack was now calm and peaceful, but the brow of Claus had become lined with deep thought. Nasile sighed at the change in her foster son, who until now had been ever joyous and smiling, and the thought came to her that never again would the life of the boy be the same as before this eventful journey with the master. Chapter 7 Claus Leaves the Forest When good Queen Zerline had touched the golden chalice with her fair lips, and it had passed around the circle in honor of the traveler's return, the master woodsman of the world, who had not yet spoken, turned his gaze frankly upon Claus and said, Well... The boy understood, and rose slowly to his feet beside Nasil. 
Once only his eyes passed around the familiar circle of nymphs, every one of whom he remembered as a loving comrade, but tears came unbidden to dim his sight, so he gazed thereafter steadfastly at the master. I have been ignorant, said he simply, until the great Ack in his kindness taught me who and what I am. You, who live so sweetly in your forest bowers, ever fair and youthful and innocent, are no fit comrades for a son of humanity. For I have looked upon man, finding him doomed to live for a brief space upon earth, to toil for the things he needs, to fade into old age, and then to pass away as the leaves in autumn. Yet every man has his mission, which is to leave the world better in some way than he found it. I am of the race of men, and man's lot is my lot. For your tender care of the poor, forsaken babe you adopted, as well as for your loving comradeship during my boyhood, my heart will ever overflow with gratitude. My foster mother, here he stopped and kissed Nasil's white forehead, I shall love and cherish while life lasts, but I must leave you, to take my part in the endless struggle to which humanity is doomed, and to live my life in my own way. What will you do? asked the queen gravely. I must devote myself to the care of the children of mankind, and try to make them happy, he answered. Since your own tender care of a babe brought to me happiness and strength, it is just and right that I devote my life to the pleasure of other babes. Thus will the memory of the loving nymph Nasil be planted within the hearts of thousands of my race for many years to come, and her kindly act be recounted in song and in story while the world shall last. Have I spoken well, O master? You have spoken well, returned Ak, and rising to his feet he continued, Yet one thing must not be forgotten. Having been adopted as the child of the forest and the playfellow of the nymphs, you have gained a distinction which forever separates you from your kind. Therefore, when you go forth into the world of men, you shall retain the protection of the forest, and the powers you now enjoy will remain with you to assist you in your labors. In any need, you may call upon the nymphs, the riles, the nooks, and the fairies, and they will serve you gladly. I, the master woodsman of the world, have said it, and my word is the law. Claus looked upon Ack with grateful eyes. This will make me mighty among men, he replied. Protected by these kind friends, I may be able to make thousands of little children happy. I will try very hard to do my duty, and I know the forest people will give me their sympathy and help. We will, said the fairy queen earnestly. We will, cried the merry Riles, laughing. We will, shouted the crooked nooks, scowling. We will exclaimed the sweet nymphs proudly. But Nasil said nothing. She only folded Claus in her arms and kissed him tenderly. The world is big, continued the boy, turning again to his loyal friends, but men are everywhere. I shall begin my work near my friends, so that if I meet with misfortune, I can come to the forest for counsel or help. With that, he gave them all a loving look and turned away. There was no need to say goodbye, by for him the sweet, wild life of the forest was over. He went forth bravely to meet his doom, the doom of the race of man, the necessity to worry and work. But Ak, who knew the boy's heart, was merciful and guided his steps. Coming through Burzee to his eastern edge, Claus reached the laughing valley of ho ha -Ho. On each side were rolling green hills, and a brook wandered midway between them to wind afar off beyond the valley. At his back, the grim forest, at the far end of the valley, a broad plain. The eyes of the young man, who had until now reflected his grave thoughts, became brighter as he stood silent, looking out upon the laughing valley. Then, on a sudden, his eyes twinkled, as stars do on a still night, and grew merry and wide. For at his feet the cowslips and daisies smiled on him in friendly regard. The breeze whistled gaily as it passed by and fluttered the locks on his forehead. The brook laughed joyously as it leaped over the pebbles and swept around the green curves of its banks. The bees sang sweet songs as they flew from dandelion to daffodil. The beetles chirped happily in the long grass and the sunbeams glinted pleasantly over all the scene. Here, cried Claus, stretching out his arms as if to embrace the valley, will I make my home. 
That was many, many years ago. It has been his home ever since. It is his home now. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fighting Moose Podcast. Please join us next time for the second part of The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus, written by L. Frank Baum. Today's music was provided by the artist Drake Stafford. For more information to download and or listen to audio or materials from all our recordings, or to contact us, please visit www.thefightingmoose.com. And as always, try and do a random act of kindness every day. Whoop! Shark attack! Nom 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 nom! Jellyfish! Pan sandwich! Turkey! Snowman! Dolphin! Helicopter! Last supper! Monkey in the zoo! What? Near shift! <laughs> 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 <laughs>